All right, so good morning, everybody. My name is Jesse, and welcome back to another exciting Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants broadcast. I know we've got some familiar faces in the crowd, but if you are new to us, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. We do about 50 live, free, interactive broadcasts every single month, and everything we do goes to our YouTube channel, so you can check out this program in like two years. You can check out 3,000 other broadcasts. You can check out pretty much anything on any scientific or exploration topic imaginable. Now, today I'm particularly excited because we are diving in headlong into an epic World Oceans Week. We have been doing this every year since our inception. We are on broadcast number two. I had the chance to hang out with Andy Cross just a second ago, and that was an exciting and perfect start to our program series. But today we continue on with the amazing Ramba Jormansen. She is going to talk today about diving deep inside our planet. We're featuring a lot of scuba divers on this series, needless to say. But in conjunction with the amazing folks at the Explorers Club, I'm really, really pleased today to feature Rambo's work because she specializes in diving inside our planet. She is a cave diver, which is one of the most dangerous, but also most spectacular ways of exploring planet Earth that you can possibly imagine. It's one of the most niche fields on the Earth. And I'm so excited to dive in with some of her recent expeditions, hear about some of her upcoming programs, and learn more about this really special and unique ecosystem and place on planet Earth. So without further ado, Ramba, who is almost as, in, in fact, not almost, Ramba is one of the few people as enthusiastic as I am when we were getting ready for this broadcast. So it's so nice to have you today joining us um, and take us away. I can't wait to literally and figuratively dive in and to say that joke at least 10 more times. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, you so much, Jesse. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. And really nice to meet you all. Thank you for tuning in. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about, like Jesse said, cave diving and also aquifer conservation and what an aquifer actually is. And uh, the project that we did <clears throat> was called the Shunan Ha Project. But before, I'll just a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Ranma Jormansson, and it was a very good pronunciation, Jesse. I'm very impressed. <laughs> the funny name is because I'm from a very little country called the Faroe Island, which is based in the middle of the North Atlantic. Uh, I was born and raised there, but currently I now live in the south of England in a place called Cornwall. <clears throat> I, am, um, I have been diving for 15 years. I was traveling around Australia and I'd seen Finding Nemo. Um, and then, of course, if you were there, you had to go and try go dive on the Great Barrier Reef. And I was actually quite scared of sharks and all of the, you know, dangerous things in the ocean that might come and bite me. However, the first time I managed to put my mask on and actually look underneath and could see what was there, it was like completely falling in love. And since then, my entire life has been chasing how I can work within diving. Um, so I became a dive instructor where I was teaching when I lived in Denmark. And I am a cave diver, as Jesse said. I've been cave diving since 2015. Um, I also now work as head of sales for a company called Fourth Element. And we make scuba diving equipment. So we're a premium brand. But what I'm most excited about about my company is that we're very environmental as well and sustainable. For example, we have just developed the world's first recycled dive fin. Um, and then Jesse was also mentioning the Explorers Club. I'm a member of the Explorers Club and I was very excited to meet the founder of Exploring by the Seats of Your Pants there as well. And I am a co-founder of Nixie Expeditions. A little bit more about Nixie in a bit. But today, as I said, we're going to be talking about cave exploration and aquifers and aquifer conservation. Uh, Shunan Ha is uh, Mayan and means Lady of the Water. And the project that we did was in November 21. And it was a project that was two years in the planning. <clears throat> it was delayed because of the pandemic. However, this was a blessing in disguise as it gave us the opportunity to really expand upon our expedition. So at the end of planning, we actually had 22 people on the expedition and we were 16 divers where I was one of them. So as I said, it was in Mexico and on the Yucatan Peninsula here in Tulum. So if you think about the Yucatan Peninsula here, so what the peninsula essentially is, is, is an ancient fossilized coral reef. And as you can see here, the ocean levels have been rising and falling over the many last about 800,000 years here. And so this coral reef has been fully exposed or it has been fully underwater. 
Now, because the coral reef, the fossilized coral reef is, um, is a carbonate reef and made of magnesium and calcium mainly and limestone, it's actually, it, it dissolves when acidic rainwater comes through it. And so these, the rainwater dissolves it into caves. So if you just think about the whole peninsula as essentially just a Swiss cheese, just riddled with tunnels. And here you can see the, the what they call the cenotes in the, on the Yucatan Peninsula are essentially just the cave uh, roof that's collapsed in on itself. So what is an aquifer then? But if, if you remember, I said the peninsula is a Swiss cheese. Well, that means that all of the fresh water sits underneath then. Um, so it just runs down here. And over here on the sides of the peninsula, you have the ocean that kind of presses in on it. But because fresh water is less dense than seawater or salt water, it sits on top. And so it becomes like an inverted lens. Now, why is this aquifer so important? Well, this is where the entire um, city of Tulum and the people here on the peninsula get their rainwater or their drinking water from. And because of the entire peninsula here be actually being interconnected, um, you have to be really careful that you don't pollute your drinking water. This picture over here to the left is a picture um, that's taking just uh, underneath a laundry service um, outside of Tulum. And a friend of mine was diving underneath the caves here from uh, underneath the laundry. And this is all bacteria and it's not supposed to be there. <coughs> but because the locals actually don't really know what's underneath them, what my friend then did well, she went up to the laundromat afterwards and showed them this this is exactly what's happening underneath you and the people who all, all, uh, owned the laundry service said they didn't know this so they changed their procedures and when my friend went there a couple of weeks after it was all um it was all gone again so it's also about creating awareness and, and showing people what's underneath now with the whole peninsula, everything is actually connected. So Tulum is here, which I said that we we're going to do the expedition. But here up on the northwest side, you have the Chicxulub crater. And this is the meteorite that hit 65 million years ago and, um, um, and was the uh, source of the uh, or cause of the extinction of the dinosaurs. But when it hit, it fractured the entire peninsula. So there's a fracture running down here, down to Belize, and there's another fracture running from Belize up north to Holbosch Island that's up here. And as you can see, this fracture goes straight past Tulum. And there's actually a theory that the fracture itself is a water bearing cave. So not only is there an aquifer here that you think might be isolated, but it turns out that there might actually be a current that's running from down south and up north and even from up here all the way down here. So if you do pollution up here, which can come from pig farms and, and agriculture or, or just, you know, sewage put into the groundwater, and it can actually bring all the pollution down to South to Belize and even up further north to Tulum. And now here they're doing massive amounts of work to try and help protect the corals. But all of that water runs out into the ocean and then also adds to damaging the corals. So it's not just a local problem for an aquifer that you need protection. It's, it's, you have to look at the whole peninsula and try and protect it. So one of the exciting things about these caves, especially that you can find so many cool things in there. And as I said before, once the water levels were lower about 10,000 years ago, you can find so many remains because all of the fresh water sits inside of these caves. And you had humans and animals venturing inside of these caves in search of fresh water. But you also found evidence of an ancient mining site where the people would go and mine for things like ochre. And ochre was, was seen as, um, as holy and they would use them in, in ceremonies. But it was also, it's also believed that ochre is a form of natural insect repellent as well. Um, so it's, there's some fantastic things that you can find inside of these caves as well that really needs protection.
So we were the team, we were the first female um, cave exploration team um, put together. You have myself here. And then we came from all over the world, Australia, Belgium, Melodies from Mexico and Maria from Denmark and Julia from Germany. So we were a very big and diverse team from all over the world with very diverse skill sets as well. So for doing our first exploration project, we needed to learn how to do surveying, which essentially means creating a map of the cave. And here you can see our mentor uh, and explorer extraordinaire, Robbie Schmidtner. He's been exploring out in Mexico for over 20 years, and he's showing us how to do surveying and how to do a mapping. So you essentially need to look at three things. So first you have a compass here, so you can see. So you tie your line in both as a lifeline to show you the way back out, but you use the line to, um, to create your map. So once you have tied your line on, then you line up your line up against this compass here, and then you write down the compass heading. Then you use your dive computer and then you measure the depth that you're at and then you measure how far that line is. And on an exploration line, there is a knot every 10 feet. So you just essentially count knots until your next tie off and then you write it down. So that's how you build your map point by point. Um, here is what it looks like when you're in the water. Um, and it sounds very easy to do mapping as you're diving, but once you're diving and have to have control over both where you're going and doing exploration, it can be quite task loading. Um, it's very important to, to be really precise because if you're not precise taking um, all of your data back out again, the map that you create can become wrong. So, so it's important that you take your time doing it, but at the same time, you can get so engulfed in doing your, your job that you can kind of forget what's happening around you. And as you know, with cave diving, the only way out is going back the same way. So you have to be ultra careful and ultra conservative about your gas. Because if you calculate wrong or if you get distracted for too long, you might run out of gas, which is also why we never dive alone. We always have a buddy with us that helps us and, and, and looks after you. So one person does the surveying and the other person makes sure and keeps an eye out on for the um, safety. Um, here is a little video. Um, oh no, not yet. A little bit further. I'm actually going to go first tell you about the first day of exploration that we did. Um, we start by marking these line arrows here. So as you can see, the arrow is is yeah, as an arrow. So you put that on your line, so it points to the exit. But the, the line arrow also works as a marker. So when you create your map, you give your marker a name and then you write that down on your map so you can see exactly where this point was. Um, there might be something interesting there, maybe some old bones or a lead to another cave or another tunnel that you can go have a look. So it's very important they all have individual names. So that was the first thing that we did. Next, we plan, put all of our equipment in the back of the truck and then we drive out into the jungle. It was about a 20 minute drive outside of the town of Tulum until the cars couldn't go any further. Um, then we had to take all of our equipment out, but thankfully we still had Robbie's old Tacoma um, who could carry the tanks so we didn't have to carry them because it was another 20, 30 minutes of walking with all of that uh, equipment into the jungle until only a small machete path was left. And then we came to the first cenote. And this one was called the Swamp Cenote. And I think you can see why it was called that. Over here to the right, this is actually where the entrance to the cave system was. So the team that was set up here would have to wade through that mud every single time they had to go to and from the cave system. So it was a very dedicated team that was uh, being put there who were Julia and Ellen. We continued further into the uh, jungle, another half an hour as well, carrying all of that equipment with us. And then we came to this cenote. 
it was enormous. It was essentially two roofs that had collapsed and you had a bridge in between. So we had a beautiful base camp here, as you can see, which was sheltered when it was raining. And this is where we would set up for the next two weeks and go diving from. So here, Maria and I um, are getting ready for our very first exploration dive. Now, as I said, we've been planning this for two years, so we were very, very excited to get started. But also, we just didn't know what we're going to find, uh, which is both the really exciting part of exploration, but can also be a little bit daunting. So we're very focused, made sure that we double and triple check all of our equipment, that everything is working. We do very extensive pre-dive safety checks on the surface where we check each other. And you can see that's Maria and I here just chatting our dive plan through. And then we go down into the cave system here and we put down our first marker. Now, here is the video. I'm going to show you in a little bit what we found in there, but I just want to show you our reaction when we came out of the cave system from our very first exploration dive. <laughs> I'm still really bad. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to see you, girl. That was amazing. That was so cool. Such yeah. a grumpy looking cave, though. It's just grumpy. like, wow. Oh my God. Oh, proper just... dragon cave with stellar heights and stellar whites all over the place. And just yeah. dark and teeth and just whining through the ground. Oh. Beautiful. And it's like a sleeping beauty because as soon as you just put a little bit of line or a little bit of bubble, it's like, oh, it starts drizzling down. And it's all <laughs> white underneath. <laughs> Stunning. Yeah. And yeah, there's a bit more of Marie and I being very excited, but this is essentially what we found. And like she said, it was such a grumpy looking cave. It felt like swimming into the belly of a dragon. And you can see all of these stalactites or stalagmites that have been growing and developing for thousands of years down. And you can see how the water levels have been going up and down everywhere. And it was just like, just such a magical cave. And we were so lucky finding this cave because it was it was like a tunnel that was just winding its way through. Um, and here you can see that like there's an old riverbed flowing and the caves in Mexico can be very varied. Some are pure white, but this one was really dark. But like you said, if you just touch the, the teensy bit, bit, the cave would just kind of go poof. I know there will be, it would be completely white underneath. So you have to be careful and really um, look after that you didn't touch anything because you can lose your visibility very quickly. And here you can see from the first day of how the map of our cave started developing and each of these little points is each tie off that we then took compass heading and measured depth and then we measured distance in between. So as I mentioned earlier, you can find some really cool things inside of these caves. And so humans, um, as I said, have been looking for water and ochre and stuff inside of these caves, but how could they find their way around? And they did that by placing way markers and cairns. And we found one such cairn inside of the caves. Um, and the reason why we thought this was a cairn, because there's nothing else around here. And we investigated the ceiling as well, and there's no stalactite. And this stalactite was just so precisely sta stacked on top of each other. And it was just directly pointing into the cave and kind of backing us in uh, forward. And the last time this section of the cave was dry was about 10,000 years ago. So it really gave us goosebumps getting this message back from the past. And after finding this cairn, we started finding other really exciting signs of human activity in there. For example, here to the left, you can find remains of an old bonfire. And here's another stalactite that's been falling down. And it might have, like, it could have been there by accident, but again, this one had, like, it was a clear ceiling. There was no other stalactites there. And this one was just so precisely pointing straight into the cave that we thought that probably is another way marker as well. So for this expedition that we did, 
Um, you can see here the yellow bits are existing or explored cave systems. The red ones are the ones that we explored and mapped during our expedition. And if you have a look around here, there, of course, is loads and loads of other potential of cave systems here. So we have only just scratched the surface. And what we did, though, was um, we explored 3,214 meters. And I do apologize. We work at the metric system here in Eurasia, and I haven't converted it to the imperial system. Um, but as I mentioned earlier as well, we were doing water samples to see if we could prove that there is current inside of these cave systems that runs from south to north. So we took nine water samples strategically placed both south and north of Tulum as well as the caves, and they clearly show that there's less contaminants in the water south of Tulum than it is uh, north of Tulum, so ergo the water runs up north. Um, well, of course, Robbie's ultimate goal of this is um, we have, again, just scratched the surface of exploration. There's so much more to do and so important that you protect this aquifer. So with our expedition, we wanted to create awareness of what's happening underneath the feet of people inside the veins of the planet Earth. And it's actually still the, one of the final frontiers of exploration that we can still do on our planet. And there's so much left to do in Mexico alone that Robbie will wants, uh, where his goal is to establish a jungle and water research institute where, where uh, explorers and scientists can come and study both aquifers and cave systems. Now, I think that was uh, enough. I could go on forever talking about caves and cave exploration, but yeah, if you have any questions. Oh, Ram, but that was spectacular. You not only were you like perfectly, not only on time, but like ahead of time, we have an epic time for Q&A. Uh, you were one of the most enthusiastic people we've ever had on the broadcast, and the video is a testament to that. So thank you for your uh, <laughs> sheer joy at getting to explore the underwater world. This is so special. Um, YouTube class, we've got Ms. Dykstra's class, Ms. Barry's class, Ms. Lally's class, and more. Please do feel free to chime in with questions there. Mr. Baber's class, I'll come to you guys live in a second if you have any questions to share with Ramba. I'll begin with, is there something you look for in expedition partners? You've had the chance to feature a bunch of people that you've partnered with and, and gone on these dives with. Is there a skill set? Is there just a collaborative? Is there having met them before? Is there something that you look for when you're going for partners? Well, yeah, um, that's a really good question, Jesse. Um, first of all, a skill set is number one, but number two, it's really that, like, you know, we're going to do some quite intense days out in the jungle and it's quite important that you're out there with people that you kind of like <laughs> and you think are fun hanging out with so so that's uh, for our next expedition as well that's that's one of the uh the things that we've done which just putting together a team of people that we really just enjoy hanging out with but also have the good skill set of course that's needed and being a member of the explorers club as well this is where i luck out and uh, you know have uh, I'm able to meet like the most amazing people on the planet uh, and all of them are very excited about sharing their experiences but also learning about yours and to pay it forward. Yeah, Ramba, that was a beautiful answer and I'm so glad you highlighted the uh, you know good people aspect of it. I think a lot of people assume okay we're looking for the best of the best and they've got to be serious people and I think sort of early astronauts and early big explorers were very much like that and increasingly we hear from people like you where it's like it's just great to hang out with your friends in super cool places and do amazing stuff together. And I love it. So thank you for that very, very much. Um, I'm going to have, gee, so many questions coming in on YouTube. Miss Dylan's class, they're at, um, joining us in Missouri. Uh, they want to know, have you ever gotten lost and how do you find your way when something unexpected happens? That's a very good question. So when you do cave uh, cave dive training, one of the most important things that you learn is never to be uh, more than a hand uh, arm's reach away from your line. So your line is the way that shows you out, uh, points the way out. So I've never gotten lost, but I have been in situations where I can't see anything. And this can be anything from your bubbles disturbing silt on the ceiling and then taking away the visibility. Or you have come over into something and disturbed a silt cloud and so you can't see anything and that's where training kick in and that's where training is so important and then it's just keeping calm and then up reaching for your line and then you just stop everything that you're doing 
and then you just focus getting your breath under control again and then you think what am i doing next and then you act and then it's all about taking it calm and taking it slow as soon as you start rushing around that's when accidents can happen but if you just take it easy and you can breathe you can solve any situation i absolutely love this when we hear this from cave divers a lot it's sort of the ultimate field where preparation and relaxation uh lead to not just success but safety and i'm so glad that we got that question so thanks miss dylan's class um okay i'm going to do sort of back-to-back -back questions here because they are related miss johnson's class so wj baird uh blenheim ontario they want to know have you seen any living things in caves? Anything that jumps out? Anything weird stuff you've found? That is another really good question. And yes, we have seen loads and loads of, of really cool things in the caves. Um, one of the things, it, it's both good and bad. So there's lot, there is actually quite a lot of life within the caves, but it's very sparse. You, you don't see much of it because there's no light into the caves. So there's very little food in there, but there are critters and little um, invertebrates living inside of the caves, but they're purely white because they've never seen daylight before. Um, but what, another thing that's bad, which for example happens a lot in the caves of Mexico, is that you go into the caves and these little fish follow your light into the caves and they kind of come hunting with the light. So they come into the caves and then they start eating the little cave dwellers that are in there. So that's actually not a very good thing. And we need to be careful not to have our lights on as we go into the caves in the beginning. So we try not to lure these fish in, but the fish are actually quite smart and they figure out how to follow cave divers in for tourism caves. Um, but on uh, upcoming expeditions, this is something that we will be looking at is exploring and trying to find new animals via uh, eDNA. We could do a whole other broadcast on that. I will actually follow up with that in just like a second after another question. You're the first person ever to mention human behavior and cave diving impacting the behavior of animals in it. That's really interesting. I, I like that. So thank you for that. Um, okay. Miss Dykstra, her water rockers in Guelph want to know what's the coolest creature of these creatures. Now we've established there's animals in the caves. Is there like maybe it's one individual animal that you were like, that's a freaking freaky fish? Or maybe it's like a species that really jumps out. What jumps out? <laughs> so I have two actually so one one was a live animal that i found in the caves and that's like when you go uh, into a cave system and that is it's got a uh, an air pocket on top of it but there's not light and then you have tree roots coming in then you can have catfish in there and catfish when you swim through they have like these little um like shiny eyes coming through the roots and it can be quite creepy to be honest at the beginning when you don't know what they are but once you know what they are you it, they're just kind of like friends as you come in and you see them but well, the first time i saw them i have to admit i was a little bit spooked um the one that i've seen as well on my most recent trip diving in mexico was uh, was again uh, the last time that section of the cave was dry which was 10,000 years ago and that was little footprints that were still in the mud that was uh, from an uh, agouti and they're still there so only just a hand swipe wrong and you could delete uh, like delete these uh, footprints there ever but you know just seeing these footprints still encapsulated in the mud just 10,000 years ago it was just again fantastic to see um, <laughs> uh, on the animal note, you talked about eDNA. I want to follow up with this and then I'm going to Mr. Baber's class live in a second. What is eDNA for people who have never heard of this and why is it the coolest science thing of all time? <laughs> <laughs> so eDNA means environmental DNA. And eDNA is, is a DNA sequencing of just water samples, which means that it's minimally evasive. You don't have to go in and take a biopsy of an animal. You can just take a water sample and then you do DNA sequencing of it. And um, the first time they did eDNA sampling from within caves was with the Marine Genome Project in Sardinia. And even then, they, despite this being the first time they've ever done it, lots of mistakes were done, they still managed to discover new nine new species just from a water sample. And they managed inside of the hydrogen sulfide cloud, they managed to find uh, evidence of a bovine that went extinct in the 1600s. So it's such a cool uh, yes. new science that can teach us so much. 
it's uh, we've spoken with uh, researchers on land, largely water. It seems to be a, it's a fantastic tool for exploring water biodiversity in general. But whether you're in a cave, whether you're out in the ocean, instead of having to find the fish or find the species you're looking for, I mean, great if you can do that. Yeah. But you could literally just take a sample of water. Let's just uh, reiterate this and assess it for DNA with modern technological and biotech and find out what species are in that area. That yeah. is unbelievable. It's so cool. And especially like if you're inside caves and there might only be like five of that one animal. So instead of taking one animal out and there's only four left, you can just take a water sample and leave the animals in there. Cool. Um, Mr. Babers Cloud, Richmond, Virginia. Uh, just audio class, but come on in. You're, you're good to go and share away, man. Hey. Thanks so much for having us and doing the presentation. It was amazing. Um, by one of my students, Maurice Davis, had a question asking, what is the deepest you've di uh, dived into a cave before? Oh, thank you, Maurice. That's a very good question. So I haven't actually done depth as in down. I've, the deepest might have been, let me try and calculate. I'm so sorry. I'm in the metric system. So that will be about like 40 meters. So 40 meters in feet is about 130 feet, but that's just down. Inwards, I've traveled um, about a kilometer, so just, just less than a mile inside a cave. So my longest dive in time-wise is about, I think, three and a half hours was my longest dive. But, you know, there's lots of very much uh, like, you know, Jill Heinerth, who I know has been on uh, Exploring yeah. by the Sea many times, so who is my personal hero. I mean, she has done some absolutely just enormous dives. Right? I've, I can't even begin to imagine how many hours her dives were, but yeah. Well, uh, always spectacular to highlight any superlatives. It's one of our favorite style of questions from classes. So thank you, Mr. Baber. And I will come back to you guys in just a second for more. So keep that mic on and, and stay tuned. Get more questions from your class. YouTube has a whole bunch more. Holy. Okay. Uh, have you found something like a treasure? Any, any pots of gold at the bottom? Or is it all treasure to you? Uh, no, not treasure. I've, I've like... For me, the biggest treasure was finding that cairn as well that was literally pointing us into the cave. And actually, it came at such a, a fortune, like opportune time as well, because Maria and I, who was my dive buddy for this exploration project, we had hit a dead end at that point, and we couldn't really find our way onwards into the cave system. So we've been trying for like a couple of days, trying to find our way into the system. And it can, it like surprisingly, it can be quite hard knowing where to go, especially when you have, you know, both up and down and left and right, and you can go everywhere. But so we've spent like three days in the same place and we're getting quite frustrated because we couldn't find our way through and we felt like we we're wasting time on this precious expedition. But then once we found this, this cairn that was actually just pointing us into the cave, that was that was quite quite magical and it felt like my biggest treasure that I found. <laughs> It's pretty cool. It's a very unique story. So thank you for that. Um, Miss Dacer's class, Philly, we haven't had a Philadelphia class in a long time. This is exciting. Uh, how many caves have you explored? Are we are we still tallying or is it just too many to count at this point, Randall? <laughs> so I have the I've only done one when there's no one that's been there before. Uh, I have been diving in many different caves and I've been diving in mines, both here in England and in Sweden. Uh, I've been diving in caves in Florida as well. There's some fantastic caves up in Florida. Uh, there's springs up by, uh, by, yeah, behind springs in Gainesville. But for being the very first person inside these caves, that's the, that's the only one I've done so far. Yeah. Well, it's uh, uh, lots more to explore and many expansions to come. By the way, at the beginning, I have to say, because you said that I did a good job pronouncing your name and it's fairly easy, but your expedition, I decided to just leave that entirely to you because <laughs> I would butcher that terribly. So um, a very cool spot though. Very uh, first time we've ever featured anything from there, which is pretty exciting for our cave diving expertise as a project. <laughs> Um, Mr. Babers class, I'm coming back to you guys in Richmond, and then we'll go back to YouTube for a few more. You guys are a fantastic audience today. Miss Lally's class, we'd love to hear from some Charlotte as well if you want to give us some questions from North Carolina. But Richmond, you're back in, Mr. Babers. Take us away. All right. So I have a question for one of my students, Nyari Brooms, um, about uh, the pollution aspect that you were talking about. Like, um, where is this pollution coming from? And um, is it has have you ever seen a very severe case where it was almost too much? That's a very, very good question. I'm really glad you asked that. Um, yes, but so so the pollution essentially comes, especially around Tulum, 
comes from sewage. So toilets right down into the aquifer. Uh, the town of Tulum diving underneath it, despite it being riddled with caves right underneath, is now so polluted that it's completely dangerous to dive there uh, now. You can't dive there anymore without diving in a hazmat suit and full protection. We did have a person that went diving there a couple of years ago and he had to be hospitalized from severe infection for about three days afterwards. So, and, and Tulum is, is growing, tourism is growing a lot there as well. So it, it is very important that we bring this awareness. And again, if, if the locals don't really know what's happening underneath, like how can they do anything about this problem? So Robbie is, is working very hard with hotel developers and showing them and, and providing analysis of what's underneath the ground and the caves and everything. So they know what they're building on top of and how they can protect what's going into it. I'm going to follow up briefly because there's an organization or a campaign, and I can't for the life of me remember the name of it right now, but it's about making sure that dive sites and dive areas are done in a sustainable, good way. Do you know what this is offhand? I can try and find a name for this, but there's like a thing for students or classes. If you ever go scuba diving, you can look for that as a certification. Yes, um, it's called the Green Fins. Thank you. Cool. Green Fins. So I'll yes. find this link for everybody to make sure. So if you ever... I, I've been scuba diving in a few places, I've been snorkeling in a few places, and sometimes it's really well managed and you can tell they've taken 50, 100 years at their count. And there's other places I've been where the dive trainer was grabbing on coral to move himself along and it was like, what are you doing? Yeah. So it's, yeah. There's so, actually a new, um, uh, PADI has just launched a new accreditation to dive centers called PADI Eco Dive Center. So if you are going out diving, you can request to go dive on a PADI Eco Dive Center and you know that they have environmental uh, sustainable practices and they're supporting the green fins and all of that. So. Fantastic. I've just brought up the website for Green Fins. If you want to check that out as well, I'll find the Patty site in a second. And I'm going to follow up with a Patty thing in a minute. But first, I'm going to segue into it with a question, which is uh, for Miss Johnson's thoughts. Where did you do your first dive? And I want to follow up with how old were you when you did your first dive as well? So uh, I did my very first dive on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And oh. I was uh, 20 years old. <laughs> Stop it. I think, Joe, uh, similar situation. So mine was in like a quarry in Ontario, which for right. <laughs> class, classes that are not on amazing places like the Great Barrier Reef, you can learn to scuba dive anywhere, starting in a pool. Um, but I think Joe did his dive training there too. And I mean, if is there a more special place in the world to learn to dive in the Great Barrier Reef? I don't oh, know. Oh, it was, it was just magical. However, I have to say, I still love diving, even if it is just a pool. There yeah. is that feeling of being weightless and all that, that you have have is just you know like you're moving in a 3d kind of way and you're focusing on your breath and being in the water it's my favorite thing so for our students today i'm going to be harping on this all oceans week long and i mean as students we're getting the chance here for people like you who are really accomplished divers been to really special places but if you learn to dive which you can do anywhere on planet earth you open up 70 percent of the earth to you in a way that it simply isn't if you don't have that skill and a lot of our audience today we got a lot of grade three classes if you are in grade three you can start on the path to being a scuba diver with Patty Bubble Maker. So Patty's like the leading dive organization. I'm Patty certified. I'm sure that's how you got certified. And so Bubble Maker is eight. And then open water dive, which is what I have, you can start at 10 years old. And it's like black magic. Like the fact that you can breathe underwater will never cease to be something that like seems like humans should just not have the ability to do. And it's amazing that we have this capacity with technology. So I'm so glad you shared that. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Um, Mr. Babers class, I'm coming back to you. I'm going to take maybe one or two more questions from YouTube, and then we're going to wrap up because we are near the end of the broadcast. I told you it would fly by, Rand. I was I yeah. um, head back to Richmond. Come on in, guys. Uh, so I actually have this question from a couple of students, uh, Devon, Elena. Uh, very, very curious because you said you've seen so many different kind of animals um, in your dives. They were wondering if there's ever been an, a, a dangerous encounter with an animal. That's another really good question. Um, no is the short answer, but there is one particular fish that I'm quite scared of, which is called the Titan triggerfish. <laughs> and so it's not dangerous in the sense that it can kill you in any sort of way. But this particular fish has a nest on the bottom of the ocean. And when it's in the nesting season, um, its territory is like cyclical. So it goes up like that. So if you happen to swim over its territory, it can be 
and they're quite territorial and it tends to go whoosh, swim straight into your face and sometimes can knock you onto your mask and um, there have been divers who have like maybe had like a, a piece of bitten off by a knuckle or anything so nothing nothing extreme or endangered but they can be a little bit intimidating when they come charging right at your face and you don't know that they're there <laughs> Uh, well, I brought up a picture for folks, and when you look up Titan Triggerfish, the very first thing is angry Titan Triggerfish, so that <laughs> it, it fulfills your story. Uh, they're some of the most beautiful fish in the world, Triggerfish, but I've heard this from a few divers, actually, so I'll bring up the name for classes that want to look up a little bit more of them. Uh, that's, a, that's a good answer. By the way, Mr. Baber's class, this is a weird note. You guys are amazing as an audio class to come in with questions. Not only do your students have amazing questions, but you're, like, right on it every time I come to you, and I appreciate that immensely. So thank you, guys. Uh, Virginia classes. You guys are always the best. I love it. Uh, two more from YouTube, and then we are going to wrap up, Ramba. Um, Miss Lally wants to know, do you have a team that you dive with on a regular basis or do you like to put together a new team for each project? Thanks, guys. And nice to have you in Charlotte. Hopefully. That is a really, really good question as well. Um, so as I said earlier, I'm the co-founder of Nixie Expeditions. And after we did this expedition here in Mexico, we it really lit a fire in us about aquifer conservation. Um, of course, we've been divers and cave divers for many years, but doing diving for a higher purpose is something that was really, really ignited in us. So Maria Bollerup is my very best friend and also my favorite dive buddy. So she and I um, have put this uh, expedition together. And here we have um, chosen a new team uh, of divers to go with. Uh, again, these are people who are amazing divers, are very good, but there's so many out there. So again, we've chosen people that we really like hanging out with as well, mm -hmm. and that we know are passionate about both caves and cave diving and also conservation. And that, that is a beautiful answer. Thank you for that very, very much. Great question, Ms. Lally's class. Thank I'm going to wrap up with Farmington, Missouri, Ms. Dillon's class, who joined us for like so many broadcasts. You guys are like, you just never do any other classes, I don't think. Uh, this is like a, a three-parter. Okay. Favorite sea animals? Do you like otters? And what's the most dangerous water animal you've encountered? And after that, we will wrap up with all our teacher friends. Ooh, that's such a good question. There's so many amazing animals out there. I think I have to say my favorite animal would be the cuttlefish. Yes. Um, we have the cuttlefish here in the UK as well. And the cuttlefish literally looks like a little alien as yeah. it's just going to bombing along and changing its colors and it just and like their eyes and how they're looking at you but also like how they interact with each other and they can be so clever and you know kind of masking if there's a yeah <laughs> someone else around um most dangerous uh, sea animal i mean when i learned to dive out in australia um there was there was this uh, this site called the Shelleys, and the Shelleys uh, was named that because there was this diver who picked up a sea cone. It was a cone snail, and a cone snail is actually one of the most dangerous snails out there. So as a rule, when you go diving, and and this is a rule I still uh, use to this day, don't touch anything, <laughs> and you'll be fine. There's nothing that will attack you unprovoked. Um, so you can be absolutely safe going out diving. But if you just keep your hands to yourself, you won't either um, you won't uh, danger or or endanger or hurt the animals that are living there. That's our your second speaker in a row to start off ocean to be talking about just leave things alone, observe, don't touch. It makes it healthier for the oceans. It makes sure you're not likely to end up in a situation where Titan trigger fish are attacking you or own <laughs> snails. I actually I'm a I, I pick up snails and move them off the path everywhere I go in on in Canada. And I, I have to like train myself anytime I'm not in Canada to not pick up the snails because there's many things that can happen when you touch snails and slugs <laughs> and other things. Uh, by the way, for our classes, check out the flamboyant cuttlefish in particular when you're done this broadcast. If you want a really special, amazing creature on planet Earth. They are upper upper tier, top 10, I think, of all the animals in the world. Ramba, this has been so much fun. Uh, your enthusiasm is palpable. We all want to dive with you. Uh, and I've been highlighting Nixie Expeditions if people want to check out the site there. Is there a final message you want to share with us before we wrap up and say farewell to our classes? Um, just thank you for being here as well. And thank you for amazing questions and for being curious. I mean, never stop being curious. That's the most special superpower that you can have. If you're curious, you never know where you're going to go or what you can find out.
Oh, there's no better message than that. Pennsylvania, Missouri, Virginia, Ontario, geez, all over Canada and the United States. Thank you all so much for joining us here today. We'll wrap up the broadcast there. Mr. Baber's class, thanks for joining in live. Bye for now, everyone.